Hey everybody, how's it going? It is Thursday and as I promised, I'm going to show you guys the special edition vlog, which is going to be a loose documentary about my time managing the band La Big Vic. And what I'm going to show you is footage that I shot on our US tour. And this footage, you know, I wasn't planning on ever editing this together as some sort of documentary, so it's going to be loosely connected. I'm going to talk over some of the footage just to explain what's going on. But I found this footage and I want to do something with it. And I want to share this experience. You know, I love working with bands. I love working with musicians. And La Big Vic is one of my favorite bands of all time. It's one of my favorite experiences in the music industry was working with these guys. Something you guys don't see much on this channel because in Portland, I just, you know, moving to a new city, you have to like start all over with this stuff and you have to rebuild your reputation. But I just wanted to really share this tour with you guys. So without further ado, let's dive right into it. Oh, sure. Hey, my name is Peter Pearson. My name is Emily Friedlander from La Big Vic. And we're here recording a song for Shaking Through. There will be violin, and I have two cents. Toshio has one. Are you going to do guitar? I came to New York City as a R&B singer, kind of like Japanese version of like InSync or Backstreet Boys. You're not going to get a label who finds you when you're just starting out, says, okay, uh, here's all this money and go make a record. And that is difficult, but it's a good motivation yeah. to, uh, to figure it out. My time with La Big Vic started in a very interesting way. I had known the synthesizer player Peter for years as we were label mates on New York's Friendly Ghost Recordings. I was asked to play with Lobby Vic at one of their early shows at Cameo Gallery in New York City. I sat scrunched up on the floor with a Casio keyboard for their opening number. The only issue was I didn't know when to start or stop playing. Emily Friedlander, the violinist and singer of the band, quickly let me know that the song was over and my time playing was done. Little did I know a year and a half later I would help them on their North American tour, opening for Wolf Parade's frontman Spencer Krug's side project, Moonface. I'm not into British music, I don't care for it. No. You like Rolling Stones? No, don't like Rolling the, Stones. What about it? Uh, the Beatles? No, <laughs> yeah, not in the Beatles. I'm a squatter, so when I work, I use my legs. I'm a survivor. Where wild American culture um, is very fast, I use my back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everything for me, I grew up doing this my whole life uh -huh. as a martial artist. Uh -huh. So I can work like this for an hour. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, man. Yeah, man. It's very you squatting. Japanese, so, you, know. you understand, dude? I worked for the Japanese. I was a Japanese QC for Arctic Alaska. Oh, I was cool. a king crabber fisherman. A king crabber fisherman. I learned mm -hmm. how to squat from culture of Japanese people. Oh, really? Oh, oh nice. Some, awesome. Dude. Thank you. Survive in what I eat and what I choose. Music is the way for evolution. Even though you might not think we don't win, but we will win. Because I will preach to what I know to teach people squat, manual labor, human really mankind to keep the music going, the revolution. No corporation. <laughs> Fuck the corporation. It's destruction. <laughs> As you can see, we met some pretty interesting people on the road. 7th Street Entry in Minneapolis is where we came across someone who we will call Dan. Dan was an enormous fan of Wolf Parade, Moonface, and Spencer Krug himself. Now I'd known of these kind of people's existence, but I'd never seen anything like this in my own eyes. We ran into Dan in multiple cities all across the United States. Places hours and hours away that you wouldn't think someone would drive to just see one show, but they did, and that was really interesting to see if not a bit strange. I'll never forget Chicago. 
The band had just finished up their set, and we wandered over to another venue where coincidentally, some friends of ours from New York, the band Friends and the band Splash, were also on a summer tour. Now being on the road could be lonely, tiresome, and you could feel homesick. Seeing these bands play at that time was such a refreshing and comforting feeling. I had never heard the band Splash before that night, and I kind of wish they were still around doing stuff because it was such a fun show. Maybe it's a little more special though that I only saw them play that one time in Chicago. It made that tour unique. was a cool experience because Peter's friend actually joined them for their final song. It was one of those rare instances where La Big Big broke out from being a trio and added a guest musician. Being on the road with La Big Vic and hearing the same songs night after night, week after week, was a really interesting experience. Obviously by the time the tour was over I knew every song by heart, but there was also something more interesting that happened. I watched a creative evolution unfold between night one and the final show. Whether as a creative collective or not, the band was doing things different every night and I loved it. Some nights Toshio would do more guitar solos, some nights Emily would add more delay to her violin, sometimes Peter would add more frills to his synthesizer playing. I was already very familiar with the first album by the time we went on tour, but something that had happened was they finished their second album right around the time we left to go on tour. Although it wasn't ready to be sold at shows yet, they were playing the songs out and fine tuning them for when they got back to New York. The next morning I had to move the car at about 6.45. Instead of going back to bed, I decided to go back to the lake. You see, this whole tour I was obsessed with the Great Lakes. It started in Chicago, but it followed us all the way through here. I swam for about an hour until our long drive to Austin, Texas. Still not in the car. Yeah. Cricket explosion. Whoa. These people are gonna hula hoop in their dreams. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, mate. This is uh, this is Toshi Masuda. In my dream. So, you know, look at that. those girls. Like, it's really pretty beautiful. You know, I, I need her, uh, you know, sort of with mermaid. <laughs> it's so beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> I have no clue what was going on with those hula hoopers, but as Toshio said, it was obviously some sort of mermaid dream. Austin, Texas was the first place I got to do laundry on tour. It was also the first place I got to sit in a backyard and relax on tour, and it was also the only time on tour that I didn't see a La Big Vic show. I wasn't feeling too well that night, so I walked back from the venue to the place we were staying. Although I didn't film it, we did have a nice time in Austin, as the next day we had some time off and we went to Barton Springs, and Peter Pearson was actually offered a job at a synthesizer repair place down there. I wonder if in some other universe he took that job. Anyway, the next day we left Texas and we went into the deep south, to Arkansas, which was one of my favorite La Big Vic shows and favorite music experiences of all time. Oh, yeah. 
I've never quite had an experience like the one I did in Arkansas, but I'm extremely happy I did. What an interesting place filled with interesting people. That guy on the right, I believe his name was Brantley. We talked for a while and he told me all about his life there. I didn't think I was ever going to connect with someone from that part of the world, but I really did. I wish I kept touch with that guy. He was in a conflicting part of his life because he was part-time truck driver and part-time graphic designer, which I felt was a really interesting concept, really interesting thing to be going through in this time in this world. World. Arkansas was an amazing show, and I'm not sure if it was the energy of the crowd, but something really happened with La Big Vic that night. I heard them play melodies that I'd never heard them do before. I heard Toshio do amazing things on guitars. Emily's voice sounded amazing, and Peter's synthesizer playing was top notch. I'll always love Arkansas. You can't make a buffalo roller skate. Yeah, girl, I ever did down the Arkansas. Down the Arkansas. Down the Arkansas. Down the Arkansas. You see, not only was this one of my favorite La Big Vic shows of all time, but it was one of my favorite music experiences of all time. This was a 21-up venue on a ground floor with a huge glass wall separating it from the sidewalk. Underage kids were slamming themselves against the glass wall with huge handwritten notes for the bands to read. They were so excited that people were coming to Arkansas from all over the world, bringing culture and new music and new ideas. They couldn't hold it in. They had to tell the bands how they felt. It was funny that there was those small wind chimes at the house we were staying in Fayetteville, because about an hour and a half later, unbeknownst to us, we would come across the world's largest wind chime. You see, I had asked Brantley if there was any hot springs to soak in near Fayetteville. He told me to go check out Eureka Springs, so we went there. Although we didn't make it to any hot springs, the road Brantley set us down led us to some amazing countryside in Arkansas and the world's largest wind chime and truck stop. It must have been a really interesting experience for someone like Toshio, coming all the way from Japan seeing all these southern truck stops and sideshows. We found a t-shirt at this truck stop with a strange alien face on it. Toshio bought the shirt and for the rest of the tour he was known as Alien Boy. When he got home from the tour, he created an entire album under the moniker Alien Boy, which you can hear on vinyl out on low bit landscapes today. <laughs> Now if there's anywhere in the United States that feels like you are in a complete different planet, I would have to say it is Nash Vegas. Firstly, I can't believe the footage of them riding this bull exists, but I am extremely happy that it does. At this point in the tour, Alien Boy was coming out of Toshio. Alien Boy was born in Nashville, and you can see him wearing this shirt right here. Although their show had a lukewarm attendance, right across the street from the venue they played was an amazing nightclub that was blasting 90s R&B rap and hip hop and only served 40s. This was the last time we saw Toshio for probably 15 to 20 hours. We 
found him the next morning after receiving a phone call, tipping us off that he was at a certain location. We got there and we saw him, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and smiling, emerge out of a basement. We have to back up a little bit. You see, Toshio had a lot of time that day by himself in Nashville. Me, Peter, and Emily went off to Mammoth Cave, and we spent the whole day there. Toshio wanted to stay back and do a bit of computer work. When we got back to Nashville, Toshio had this Viva Nash Vegas shirt on, and he had this grand idea that he wanted to rip off his hoodie during the last guitar solo of the last song and reveal the Nash Vegas shirt. This is footage of that event. I'm talking over this image of Thomas Jefferson's hand-built house, Monticello, because I'm running out of footage and also we're wrapping up the tour. At this time we're heading back to New York City to play Bowery Ballroom, arguably the biggest show on the tour. There's so many more stories and experiences that happened opening for Moonface and our experience with Spencer Krug is another story for another day. But for now, it's time for Bowery Ballroom. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
Something I hold off talking about with La Big Vic is their style of music, because I don't think La Big Vic ever sought out to be a certain style of music, and I think that's what made them shine so much through a time when we're oversaturated with music. La Big Vic was like a chameleon of music. It could shape its sound to any room, any place, and any person it was near. If anybody with any different background in any part of the country can hear what you're creating and relate to it in any way, I think you've succeeded as a musician. There was hundreds, if not over a thousand people there. They all connected on what La Big Vic was trying to do. This was their final show, and with weeks on the road, they had more practice than they ever needed for this night. Their music sounded perfect. Yeah.